All right. Um, welcome back. We're, I'm Al Sacchetti, and we're going to talk about the crashing neonate. Uh, what's interesting is when it comes to neonates in, in the emergency department, I am much more comfortable with a really sick neonate than a non-sick neonate. And the problem is the following. If you've got a sick kid in front of you, particularly a neonate, it's pretty straightforward. You want to get, you know, a line, get a, um, make sure the airway's okay, send a bunch of diagnostic stuff off, uh, address whatever comes back abnormal, and get the kid admitted. It's pretty straightforward. And even the procedures in a neonate are easier than they are in, a, in an infant. When you think about it, uh, the kids have no body fat. So their veins are right under the, the, the skin. So it's pretty easy to get an IV in them. It's not that bad. I mean, compare that to the, like that, that three-month-old that's kind of nothing but roll after roll, um, you know, so you can't find a vein anywhere on them. And then if you have to do other procedures like the lumbar punctures, the, the, the spinal canal is about a millimeter below the skin. Actually, one of our docs, um, uh, she maintains that you don't even need to find the, the inner space to put the needle in. The bones are so soft, you can just go right through it. Um, I'm not advocating that, um, but it is something to think about in that tough tap. Uh, and then, you know, you, you don't need an x-ray. You can hold them up to the light. You can see through them. Do they have pneumonia and whatnot? So it's pretty straightforward. But what I don't like is the mom that brings the child in or the caretaker that brings the child in and says, they're breathing funny. I have no idea what to do with that. If I work them up and admit them, I'm a wimp. If I send them home, I don't sleep for a week. It's just not, I'd much rather they bring in a sick kid. And we're going to talk about sick kids because it's a whole lot easier to do them. All right. So let's talk about uh, some of the things that show up in, in sick kids. And these are the, um, uh, the misfits, the, the, the classic pneumonic for the, these kids. Uh, and there's a number of things that, that uh, can happen with these kids. One of the things is this is a really nice list. But again, you're just going to pull the plug and do everything on these kids. There's trauma. There's heart problems. There's endocrine problems, metabolic issues. Uh, inborn errors of metabolism, um, sepsis, which is kind of always migrates to the top of the list, formula problems, and then intestinal stuff and toxins. And then one of the things that, to, to remember when you look at some of these things is <clears throat> almost any of these are going to overlap with other things there. And that, that can create a bit of a problem for you. One of the things is, when you, as you go through it, certainly the endocrine is going to look a lot like the metabolic problems, which are going to lot, look like a lot like inborn errors in metabolism. So as we go through these things, let's keep in the back of your mind. If I see something abnormal, there might be something else that it's going to overlap with. That's, and some of them are, are certainly kind of interesting with, with uh, the way they present. The, the formula one I always like the best is because we, I, I practice in an urban area, and so the, the, um, uh, we're a bit of a poor uh, area. And so there's a lot of uh, times the moms will have to dilute the formula down because formula is incredibly expensive. And you wind up with the kids coming in with hyponatremia. But the kid comes in with hyponatremia, and you go, oh, my goodness. And they must have, you know, have a uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It must be an endocrine problem. So things will overlap a lot, so you've got to be a little careful with it. The best formula uh, story I ever heard was a couple months ago, uh, I came in, and the, the night doc was, was signing out to me. And she said, you know, this kid, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're admitting, we're, we're going to transfer to the, the children's hospital. Um, and they said, mom had a problem with the formula. It's like, I assumed that the kid was just, you know, they over diluted it. Well, it turned out that she had made the formula out of a bottle of vodka that was sitting in the refrigerator. So the kid basically came in drunk. Um, and, you know, and it obviously looked septic, got the whole septic workup. And somehow or another, Somebody ordered an alcohol level. I just had a force of habit in our, our emergency department. Everybody gets an alcohol level. So they ordered it on this three-week-old, and it came back like 150. You know, and the kid was happy. Um, it was just <laughs> a, a little stunad, that's all. All right. So let's, let's cone down a little bit on, the, on these misfits. Hypoglycemia. Okay. Every kid that comes in gets a, a blood sugar, no matter what. The finger stick them, you give them, get the blood sugar. No matter what their complaint is, they're going to get it. Um, you know, even if they're, they're, even if the neonate's there because their sibling is the one being treated, check the neonate anyway, okay? So they get a blood sugar all the time. All right. Sepsis is, migrates to the top of the list all the time. You know, every kid that comes in not acting absolutely 100% perfect, you got to worry a little bit about sepsis on those, those kids. So and they get the full septic workup. The CBC, the CMP, the blood cultures, the urinalysis, 
the urine stray cats. <clears throat> now, I like doing uh, lumbar punctures because I think that's the easiest of the procedure. And I always lead with that because we lead the parents in the room when you're, when you're doing the, these workups. So that's the one you're going to get. It's, it's pretty easy. The IV, you may have to poke them a couple of times. So if you start out with the IV and they get poked a couple of times, they're not going to let you do the LP. So start with the LP, you're going to get that. Uh, and then know that the, the fluid's supposed to be clear. If it comes back bloody, just tell them that's the way it normally looks. Um, and then uh, get the blood. And then it comes time for the straight cath. Now, if it's a male, I'll hang around and help the nurses with it. If it's a two-week-old female, I'm out of there because I have no idea where God hid the urethra in these kids, right? And you're supposed to straight cast them. <clears throat> the best thing about that is what you can do with, with these kids is, and anybody who's had a child and's changed the diaper knows, just get them exposed to the air and you can get wet. So you just have a cup ready. Uh, make sure the betadine you swab them with is take it out of the freezer, just leave it in the refrigerator, take it out and you swab them down. And then you sit them upright and gently pat their sacrum. And within about a minute or two, it looks like Niagara Falls and you'll get your urine specimen. Trying to get a urinary catheter up there is just incredibly difficult. What's really weird, if you look at what the American Academy of Pediatrics says, is they said you can either do a straight cath or a suprapubic tap. Now, Back in the 70s, when I trained, that's where we used to get all the urine. And a suprapubic tap is the following. You take this kid, you lay him down, and then you feel for the pubic symphysis, and you, you take like a 21-gauge needle and a syringe, and you stab the kid. And it's like, what? And the first time I saw the neonatologist do this, I'm like, isn't that kind of like not a good thing? We always learned that you're not supposed to stick things sharp that are in the abdomen. You know, there's like things like bowel and stuff in there. They go, don't worry about it. If you puncture the bowel, it'll seal up. Okay, um, that's a take-home message for me. Um, you know, and the first time you do it, you, you skewer the kid to the, to the mattress, you know, and so you're going a little bit too far. So, yeah, but anyway, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends doing that if you can't straight cast these kids and you can't tease the urine out of them. Non-accidental trauma, always, any kid that's acting weird, you got to think that, they, you know, look at them for non-accidental trauma. Um, Look for bruises. Kids that don't cruise don't bruise. So if kids got any bruising at all, you have to be worried about it. We had a um, uh, three-month-old in with bilateral femur fractures. And the story was that the child was walking and holding onto the coffee table and fell. And it's like, okay, you got the most precocious kid ever if they're walking at three months of age. And you got the heaviest coffee table in the world if it, this kid was able to pull it over onto themselves. So always anything that looks a little bit out of whack, just keep it in the back of your mind. Um, cardiac stuff. Cardiac stuff is kind of subtle when it's going to sneak up on you. Now, one of the things that's really nice in 2023 is almost every state will screen the kids before they get out of the nursery. They do a pulse ox on them. They do it on the, the upper extremity and lower extremity. And they're picking up all these kids with these uh, cyanotic and general anomalies before they show up uh, on our doorstep. So it's a little bit better now, but if you have a child that's tachypnic and they're hypoxic, make sure you, you, you kind of investigate them for on congenital heart disease. And it's easy enough to do. There's the, the uh, hyperoxia test. And the way you do this test is that they say you're supposed to do a blood gas. Screw that. Just get a, a pulse ox. It works, it works just as well. Put a pulse ox on their right upper extremity. Um, on, if, if you can, put it on the finger. If not, just put the pulse ox right across their palm uh, and it'll pick up. See what the pulse ox is there and then put it on their foot, their left foot. Uh, because that's before and after the ductus arteriosus. Uh, so you have to know what the pulse oxes are in either place. If there's a drop-off in the pulse ox, that means you, you've got uh, some type of like aortic um, uh, constriction there, so a coarctation of the aorta. The other thing is, if you put it on their hand and you put it on their leg, and it's hypoxic in both places, the SATs are like 80%, then you put them on 100% oxygen, and it doesn't change. That means the problem's not in the lungs. That means the problem's a cardiac problem. And the, the difficulty there is that they, for whatever reason, they're not getting the blood to the lungs, or if it's going to the lungs, it's coming back out to the wrong side of the heart. So that's something that, that if you put the, uh, the pulse oxygen on them, you put the oxygen on them, it doesn't budge. That means the kid's got a congenital heart problem, and you just move on from there. And the treatment of it, from our perspective, is um, you, you basically, it's, it's very, very straightforward. If you find that you can't oxygenate this child or you've got this pulse deficit on them and they're in congestive heart failure, uh, you just go ahead and give them the prostaglandin. The prostaglandin E1 is what you infuse into these kids. 
And when you give it, just remember, it's not like Narcan where it reverses them right away. It takes about 20 minutes before you begin to see an effect uh, with these kids. So, so start your infusion and just keep an eye on them. They can become apneic, so just you know, keep the laryngoscope handy because it, it can uh, produce apnea in these kids as well. Inborn errors in metabolism, I kind of lump endocrine uh, and inborn errors in metabolism and metabolic problems all into the same bucket because a lot of them have overlapping abnormalities when you look at them. The inborn error in metabolism, though, the thing that you want to worry about with them, most of these kids are going to show up acidotic and uh, hypoglycemic because that's, that's where the problem is. But the things that we don't always think about with them is uh, they become they, very uremic. So they may have a very elevated ammonia level. So if you're thinking the kid looks a little weird or you get the labs back and they got a low sodium and a high potassium, uh, those kind of things, add an ammonia level to them because that's something that you may, may be surprised. If you suspect they have an inborn error metabolism, it's very easy to treat. You stop feeding them, you hang D10 on them, uh, and then you get them admitted. Because the problem is, the, when they metabolize the proteins, is where they get really screwed up. So if you just give them nothing but glucose, they'll, they'll manage that just fine. They'll be able to correct their acidosis. They'll correct, their, they'll, they'll correct on their own. They'll begin to correct their, their hyponatremia, and they'll certainly correct their hypoglycemia. So you just want to hang D10 on them. Abdominal catastrophes, again, are, is something that you want to keep in the back of your mind anytime a kid shows up not looking quite right. And the two big ones that, that you really want to worry about in the neonatal period, in the, in the early infancy, uh, one is intussusception. Uh, and the classic presentation of the intussusception that you've all been taught is what? The kid's screaming and yelling, and all of a sudden they're perfectly fine. Then they're screaming and yelling, and then they're perfectly fine. And the idea is that there's this peristaltic wave that comes along where the intussusception is, and it causes severe pain. And as the peristaltic wave passes, the child feels fine again. And the truth of the matter is the most common presentation of a child with uh, intussusception, a neonate with intussusception, is lethargy. They're very lethargic. Uh, and in fact, if you were to give them Narcan, um, it, a lot of these kids will actually perk up a little bit. So they think it may be an endorphin type thing. But so when you see that kind of sleepy kid and you're like, okay, I'm going to do the whole septic workup and stuff on them, keep in the back of your mind that intussusception will present the identical way. The other thing is a mid-gut volvulus, where the, the, in utero, the intestines didn't rotate correctly. And then in life, as the kid's feeding, the, the, the intestines kind of flip over on themselves and you get a volvulus on these kids. Um, the key thing with that is they will come in with bilious vomiting. So any kid you see with bilious vomiting, you have to evaluate them for a mid-gut volvulus. And it's usually done with ultrasound nowadays. If you, you don't have uh, a radiologist who will read the ultrasound, like our radiologist won't read anything, any ultrasound on any kid under 10. That's it. It's just they don't believe that the ultrasound waves travel correctly through uh, infants, and so they won't look at it. So we had a kid that yesterday we were worried about in a susceptible one. We said, okay, we'll, we'll get an ultrasound on one of them. We didn't even get the order in, and the phone rang. It's like, uh, we don't do those. Um, you, you have to send that kid to the children's hospital to do that. I'm like, but didn't you do a residency? Wasn't that kind of part of it? It's like, we, we don't do it. Um, uh, I'm sorry, look, look, my Mercedes dealer's on the other line. I got to go, click. Um, so yeah, that's something to just keep in the back of your mind that anytime you see that bilious vomiting, you, got, you have to work them up for it. Now, if you can't get the ultrasound, you can give them um, contrast, but you have to watch it real time because what the contrast has to do is cross the midline of the gut. Uh, and you got to watch them so th to see whether they vomited up faster than it crosses the, the, the midline. And so it's, it's really more of a fluoroscopic study and it's tough for us to do. Uh, your best bet is just get them transferred out. And any children's hospital or any major pediatric center will readily accept a child if you say to them, I'm worried that this child has a mid-gut volvulus. Pyloric stenosis doesn't show up until they're usually out of the neonatal period. They're more like five, six weeks of age. And there it's, it's a progressive thing. It's not something sudden. And so the kid's vomiting for a couple of days, you know, you have a little bit better idea. And again, ultrasound's the way to make the diagnosis. If you're really good with an ultrasound, you can do that. Just put it on there and you'll see where the, the um, pylorus is hypertrophied and it shows up as that classic olive um, uh, on the uh, ultrasound, which by the way, that classic olive, 80% of people who palpate the belly of a child with pyloric stenosis don't feel an olive. So unless you're at the bar down there and there's this green thing laying on the table in front of you that you can feel, you're not feeling the olive in that kid's stomach. So don't do that. Just get the ultrasound on them. All right. This is pretty much a, a, um, uh, the same thing that, that we had just talked about. Um, 
there's a, there's a couple of things in here to, to mention, though. Seizures. Seizures in neonates are a little bit weird. They're not the classic tonic-clonic stuff. They can see, you can have some really bizarre presentations. Lip smacking, kind of pedaling motions. For me, the key to a, a seizure in a neonate is something that they're doing that's repetitive. So they, they're, they're kind of like spastic. Um, they don't really coordinate their hands. But if they're doing something repetitively, like they, they have this one leg that's constantly doing the same motion, to me, that, that sounds like it's a seizure. Um, and in, in those kids, one of the problems that can be is um, that you can get seizures that are status in these kids. And if you don't pick them up, they can go on for days. So you want to be really careful when you're looking at the kids. First thing is, obviously, if you look at them, you want to check that for electrolyte um, and their maladies. Are they hypoglycemic? Are they hyponatremic? If they're hyponatremic, you're going to treat them with 3% um, saline. Um, hypoglycemic, you're going to treat them with glucose, and we'll go over that as well. But if you get to the point now, it's like those things are normal, but they're seizing, you, you begin to have to start adding meds to them. And the first thing is obviously the, the benzodiazepines. You can treat them with lorazepam. Uh, if that doesn't work, you move down the line, you can go to the barbiturates. We don't, this day and age, we don't use the barbiturates that much. But back in the day, these were really effective medicines. Now, they both work on the same GABA receptor site as benzodiazepines. But for some reason, if the benzos don't work, the barbiturates seem to work. And then you can move on to things like Keppra. And pyridoxine is something that's really, really benign. And every now and then, there'll be a child who's got status epilepticus because of a pyridoxine deficiency. So it's worthwhile. If you've got that neonate, that 28-day-old that's seizing on you, just go ahead and give them the pyridoxine. It's certainly worthwhile to, to give them it, and there's no downside to it. One drug which works incredibly well for status epilepticus is ketamine. Um, and it has to do with the way the GABA receptors are, are uh, endocized and the NMDA receptors are moved to the surface, that you get this imbalance. And ketamine is actually a drug that works ex effectively really well. We had, um, actually it was an adult with status that didn't respond to anything, uh, so we, we quickly moved on to ketamine, and the ketamine worked on them. The problem is you don't want to really be giving ketamine to somebody under three months of age. It's, it's relatively contraindicated in somebody in that age group. But there's a number of studies looking at neonates um, with uh, status epilepticus where they did give them ketamine and it did work. So if you've gone through everything else and this kid's still seizing, uh, it's worth the, the risk of giving them the ketamine to try and stop their seizure. It, you, you know that it's not ideal but sometimes you, you wind up doing stuff that, that is not ideal. Um, we talked about some of, the, some of the other stuff there. Hypoglycemia. Like I said, most of us work in departments where the nurses automatically do, or the techs automatically do, a finger stick on every sick child that comes in. And that's, that's really what you want. You want to be able to have a, be comfortable that a, a department will do something like that. One of the, the, the um, concerns is sometimes the child doesn't present looking sick, and it's just one of those presentations of, gee, you know, Twinkie's just not behaving right. Um, that's the one where you want to make sure that you do the, the, um, uh, the, the finger stick glucose on them. Interestingly enough, sometimes if they're hypoglycemic, they won't feed well. You would think that it would be the exact opposite, but sometimes they won't feel well. They can become apneic. They will certainly become hypothermic, but just about anything will make them hypothermic. Jitteriness, grunting, um, irritability, all those. Look, if I don't eat, I'm jittery, grunting, and irritable, and the nurses will tell you that. And somebody give him a Twinkie so he's not so miserable. Um, but the, the reality of it is the kids will get that way as well. Uh, usually don't change, their, their skin color doesn't change that much, and they will become lethargic. The problem is, every lethargic kid, the last thing you want is, you know, you pick up the chart to go see the kid, and the, the triage nurse wrote, child is lethargic. It's like, oh man, you know, if you write that, now I gotta either write three paragraphs on why I don't think it's meningitis, or I gotta work the kid up, right? So, uh, but they will get a little bit uh, out of it if they, if they are hypoglycemic. All right, how do you fix it? Well, the rule of 50, okay? It's no matter what, everything should come out to 50. If you have D50, that, that giant sy syringe uh, of D50, it's one cc per kilogram. Now, the problem with, with D50 is it's really viscous. And if you sweat it out getting a 24 gauge angio in a two week old, the last thing you want to do is blow the line. Uh, so you're going to want to dilute that down. So you, want to, you can dilute it down to 20, D25, but most of the time, dilute it all the way down to D10. D10 is, is pretty much uh, about the same viscosity as normal saline, and you can push it slowly. You just have to push a little bit more. The idea is the following. 
And the rule of 50 is you multiply the number of cc's per kilogram times the percentage of glucose. So if it's 50% glucose, it's one cc per kilogram. If it's 25%, it's two cc's. If it's 10%, it's five cc's. And then if it's 5%, it's 10 cc's. So um, you can just push it that way. One of the things you can do is just draw up a, 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 an amount of D50 out of that big sticky syringe and then just add some saline to it and then just push that if, you know, once you got the viscosity down. All right, neonatal shock. The problem with neonatal shock is there's two types. There's the kids in shock and they look pretty much okay and you can't recognize it. And then the kids in shock and they're really, really, really sick and everybody's going to recognize that. The problem with it, the um, neonatal shock that's kind of early shock in these kids is they look off, but they don't look really off. And these are the things where they're septic. And early sepsis is just amazing. I remember when I was a medical student, and this, again, we're back in the 70s, um, a, there was a set of twins uh, up in the NICU, and I was rotating in the NICU. Um, and the one kid spit up. And the neonatologist said, do a septic workup on, on uh, both those kids. They did the septic workup. The kid that spit up died five, day, five hours later from groupie sepsis. Uh, they have really subtle presentations. Uh, so you want to be really careful of it. And any kid that neonate that doesn't look quite right, nobody's going to criticize you for doing a septic workup on them. Congenital heart diseases, again, you're going to be looking for, for the things. You can do the... Um, they, if they're hypoxic, it's easy. You do the hypoxia test. If they don't improve, you have your diagnosis. But if they're not hypoxic, something like a coarctation of the aorta and stuff, you can still pick that up, feel for the femoral pulses on them, take a listen to their heart, feel for the liver. If they have a big liver, they're, they're probably at risk for being in congestive heart failure. But it, again, it's just a matter of keeping eye, an eye on these kids. They're pretty easy to feel the liver. It's much easier to feel the liver on a, a neonate than it is on, on an older child. Um, but it's something, again... Those are the two big causes that you, you need to worry about in these kids. All right, early shock. Like I said, these are the ones that really can sneak up on you. The kid looks sick, but they don't look really, really sick. They don't look some, like somebody in shock. You know, and this is the one where you know, I always worry when mom comes in and says, you know, bruiser's just not behaving normally. It's like, he's three weeks old. What's normally on him? He says, well, he's normally a little bit more active. He, you know... Um, uh, I, I see him moving around a little bit more than he is. He's just kind of sleeping more than usual. Okay, your kid's getting a full septic workup. Um, you said the magic words. All right, so it's the, a change in their behavior, all right? And it's the one that, that we can get burned on. I am a huge fan of watching kids in the department uh, because they did, you see them change. Mom brings the child in. They're not quite acting right. They look pretty good to you. Um, but you say, uh, you know what? Let me keep them around for a little bit. You keep them around for a little bit. They're sitting on a pulse ox in, in a corner. You know, their brother's playing in the sharp box. They're just laying on the stretcher there. Um, and the alarm goes off on the, the pulse ox. And you go and look at the kid, and it's like, all right, the kid's apneic, but that, that happens. It's, you know, they have the apnea of neonatology. And it's like, no, that's, you know, it's a little bit longer than it ought to be. So you flick their feet, and they, they come around, and they, they start breathing again watch them a little bit longer, same thing happens again. They will do things, they will reveal themselves if you watch them for a little bit. And I have zero problem with having a kid sitting there for a little bit of time. Late shock is, you're not gonna miss this. This kid's gonna come in looking like a dish rag. They're floppy, um, they're minimally responsive, their respirations are weak, uh, their pulses are weak. All these things, that you, you can't miss these. But the bad thing about it is when they get to this point, they're really close to a cardiac arrest. So you got to jump on these, these kids uh, quickly and get your resuscitation started. Get your bloods, get your fluids on board, get your antibiotics on board. Don't worry about getting cultures. If you can't get the cultures, just get the antibiotics on board. Everybody will tell you, I'd much rather you get your antibiotics on board quickly than get the spinal tap and the straight cath for the urine and all those other things. I'd rather treat them. We'll let, you know, the... the um, uh, intensivists, you know, complained about you later on. Just get the antibiotics on board on these kids. They need fluids. Um, their blood pressures are low, okay? But a lot of times it takes the, the nurses 15 minutes to figure out how to get that tiny little blood pressure to work and it's, the machine's not working. Somebody's trying to do it manually. Just do the capillary refill. It, there's good data that if the capillary refill is prolonged, the kid's sick, okay? So, so don't worry about 
um, trying to get all the, the, the nice little vital signs for the kid. Just get the, um, uh, the, the uh, capillary refill. And the other thing that's nice is put the pulse ox on them. That little waveform that you see that pops up, if you see this nice, big, tall waveform, the kid's perfusing better. If you see that just barely visible waveform, that's the kid that you're really worried about. And they're going to have the prolonged capillary refill. All right, and this is what we talked about. Um, the capillary refill is actually better than any of the other things. Now, there's also other things to look at. Look at the skin color. This kid modeled. I mean, obviously, if, if the kid's bright pink and kicking and flailing around, they're probably not septic. But if they're just laying there, they're kind of dusky looking, that's the kid that you're really worried about. Uh, mental status. You know, every kid, it, if you annoy them enough, will wake up and cry for you. The kid that doesn't wake up and cry, no matter how you annoy them, Again, something to really worry about. Not mentioned here, but is incredibly common at our institution now, is these kids getting into the uh, adults' opioids. We probably had at least six uh, in the last year, year and a half, who just wound up um, you know, getting into the opioids. And you wonder, you know, how does a, a, a three-week-old, a four-week-old get into it? And what we found is that a lot of them with the snorting and stuff, they're, they're not particularly good hygiene, and it gets on their clothes. And then somebody picks the baby up and puts their face right up against the, the shoulders, and the powder's on the shoulders, and the kids inhale it that way. Um, some of it's a little bit more obvious. We had a six-month-old uh, who came in just out of it, opened the airway to examine it, and the packet of heroin was in their mouth. And the... the uncle who was watching them shot up in bed, fell asleep. The kid was in bed and there were 100 packets around, so the kid ate one of them. Uh, so it's a little bit more obvious that way, but you, it is worthwhile to give these kids Narcan. We've had a whole bunch of them now that just turn around. So you see that lethargic kid, do the septic workup, but it's worthwhile to give them a little bit of Narcan. All right, early versus late neonatal sepsis. They make a big distinction about this, and I don't. Um, I, I think, you know, the early onset sepsis is, you know, they're premature, they have chorioamnionitis is one of the causes of it. It's E. coli versus um, group B beta hemolytic strep. And then late onset, it's, it's uh, after two weeks of age. Uh, they, again, it's group B beta hemolytic strep, it's E. coli, but it's a little more indolent course that they're going to show up with. Um, I don't care. I, I, it's, I don't care. And I really don't even care what the organisms are because I'm going to treat them the same. They're getting a septic workup and they're getting antibiotics. You know, if you, you tell me, oh, this was a, a case where it was group B hemolytic strep, I'm like, good thing we covered for that. You know, if they say it was E. coli, yep, we had that one covered as well. And then there's some oddball things that, that will, will show up there as well. The bottom line is culture them, get them the antibiotics. And we'll talk about the antibiotics in a little bit, but for the most part, it's amp and gen. If you like to go that route, it's amp and a second, third generation cephalosporin, if not. Now, people make a big deal out of which cephalosporin to give. Cephataxine, cepha something or another, um, you know, and they say, my God, don't give them ceftrioxone. Now, if your department's like most other departments, you have people coming in with sexually transmitted illnesses that get ceftrioxone. So you always have like a little jug of it sitting down there. You can get it by the barrel in most apartments. Okay, so you can get that and give it to the kid real quickly. Um, for us to get Cepha something or another from the pharmacy, it's going to be like, you know, the kid will be on their 13th birthday before it actually comes down. Uh, so sometimes we'll just go ahead and say, this kid looks really sick, they're getting ceftriaxone. And I think nobody will criticize you for it. The problem with it is if you give it, you can't immediately push calcium on them. So you want to make sure the kid's not hypocalcemic before you do it. Um, but other than that, I think most people would say, yeah, let's get it. We, we have some really wonderful uh, pediatricians that we transfer the, these kids to. And they'll tell us, you know, thank you very much. I'd much rather you give the, the, get that first dose on board and we'll, we'll worry about the other stuff later. All right. Uh, for resuscitation, a, a couple things. Um, one is dopamine or epinephrine. I think most of us have now evolved that it's epinephrine. We're going to go epi first. Um, you can use dopamine. Absolutely nobody's going to criticize you for it. In all those big sepsis studies, um, uh, they'll tell you, in adults, don't use dopamine. It causes arrhythmias. But in kids, you can use either dopamine or epinephrine. Either of them will work just fine. Um, I think it's, it's one of the things is 
get your fluids on board first. Because a lot of these kids will respond to the fluids, get your 20 cc uh, bolus on board first, and then give them another 10 cc's. If they're not really responding to that, don't hesitate to move ahead to the epinephrine or the, the, um, the dopamine. You don't need a central line on the kid. You can, you can do it peripherally. Just make sure it's a good line. I wouldn't use one in the hand to give these drugs, but certainly um, uh, an anti-cubital, a good anti-cubital one. The other thing is, it's actually pretty easy to get femoral lines in these kids if you have the, the kits, and you always wanna make sure you have all the equipment. Um, I, I, and I'm not on anybody's speaker's bureau, but um, uh, Cook has a real nice kit where, you know, if you want to do it with ultrasound, it's great. If not, you can usually feel the artery and just go a little bit medial to it and, um, you know, aspirate and get into the, the uh, femoral vein and just thread your wire and thread the catheter over it. And then you can give the meds without it worrying about them um, uh, vasoconstricting them. Um, the other thing is uh, there are other, other things that can cause problems with the kids. Arrhythmia is every once in a while we'll see that kid that comes in with the SVT. Um, the interesting thing, they say you can treat them with adenosine. And every time I've ever done adenosine in one of these kids, it doesn't work. Um, I, I don't know why. We're supposed to get one milligram per kilogram, two milligrams, then three milligrams. Um, it just tends not to work on them. Uh, but what always seems to work is smothering the kid. Um, <laughs> You, you, it's funny because you'll say, well, give me a bag of ice. We're going to put the, smush his face in a bag of ice. Um, don't get the ice that you give to people with the, the um, sprained ankles because it's got like that little bit of um, fur that's on it that kind of makes it more comfortable for them. Get one of the bags that you send your, your specimens to the lab and with a, just regular garden variety baggy type things. Put the ice in, a little bit of water in there. And then you got to warn the parents, you know, listen, uh, your child's not going to like this. Um, yes, I, I'm going to, to do just like in the movies where the, the, the bad guy smothers somebody with a pillow. That's what we're going to do. Um, and it's amazing. You just get it close to their face and they break. It's, it actually seems to work well, way better. And it's certainly it's worthwhile trying that first. Um, ventricular arrhythmias, amiodarone or, or lidocaine seems to be the, the, um, the treatment of choice. For hyperkalemia, it's the same as adults, calcium gluconate. Uh, I've never seen torsades in a, in a neonate. If anybody has, let me know. Uh, but those are the ones that respond to uh, magnesium. All right, fluid resuscitation. One of the things is, if you get a kid that comes in that's in shock uh, and they need fluids, don't bother trying to set up the pump and everything else. I, Eileen's a big fan of this, and, and I've seen her talk about it before, and it's the push-pull. You basically get your IV in, hook a syringe up to it, um, one of the ports on it um, that's running down from your, your resuscitation fluid, which is going to be normal saline. Draw up your, your fluid, whatever you want to give the kid, pinch off the, um, the line, and then just push it in with a syringe. That's, you know, the push-pull is, is the way uh, she describes it, but that's the way you get fluid into these kids. You, you don't want to be, you know, hooking up the thing and running drips in. If they're that sick, just push it. Um, I've seen people and just take a whole bunch of flushes and just use them to, to flush in, into, the, um, into the kids as well. Make sure the flushes don't have a preservative in it because you can't push that. Uh, so it'll say on it, not for use in neonates if it has a preservative in it. Uh, so make sure you look at that first. But otherwise, just pull the normal ceiling out of the bag with a 50cc syringe and just you know, push it in. The nice thing about it is you can control and you know, you're pushing it in slowly. You can see if you're starting to descend the vein too much and you're gonna blow the vein. Uh, which is actually nice, nice to do as well. And then you give them, if they're in shock, they're getting 20 cc's per kilogram. They don't respond, they're getting another 20 cc's per kilogram. And then you're gonna start to move on uh, to your pressors. What to use, Ringer's lactate, normal saline, doesn't matter. Um, just a, a uh, crystalloid, you don't need to, no, no colloids, nothing uh, that looks like it's got a fraction associated with it. No half normal saline, no quarter normal saline, no three quarters normal saline. It's either normal saline or Ringer's lactate. Um, even if you're giving them D5 with it, it's D5 and normal saline. No more of the, the days where, you know, we say, well, we're giving them D, D5 and a quarter normal saline, and uh, nope, it's just normal saline with these kids, okay? Um, how much is too much? Well, it, too much, you, you can't get to too much until you've already resuscitated the child. So if they're not resuscitated, they don't have enough fluid. So you wouldn't get some, some fluid in, into these kids. You can follow them clinically. Check for rows, make sure they're not getting rows, make sure their liver's not getting big. Um, but it, in general, 
don't hesitate to give these kids at least 20 cc per kilogram bolus, followed by another 20 cc per kilogram bolus if they haven't turned the corner for you. All right, this is a, a complex slide. Um, I'm not a very patient individual, um, so I don't tend to wait five minutes for things to happen. It's like if, if I push the fluid and, you know, Twinkie hasn't perked up um, pretty quickly after that, they're getting another bolus, I'm going to move on to my pressors. Um, they're getting the full workup. I'm generally whining about why don't we have the antibiotics on board. I don't tend to, to go all the way through. If I got to 60 minutes and they're not resuscitated, I'm really, really pissed at the kid. Um, uh, but um, by and large, I don't time things out. It's just like, let's, let's get things done. Uh, and what you really want, and you, we all know this, um, you feel most comfortable when you've got everything done on the child. You've got their, their electrolytes uh, either back or at least off and cooking. You've, you've got, you know what their insulin is. You've got a good uh, vascular access on them. You're pretty comfortable with what's going on with their airway. Uh, if they, if there's, and we didn't talk about it. They, they have any need for any airway management, uh, take care of that early. Um, one of the things I'm a big fan of is I like to get done early the things that only I can do. So if, if a kid's got a fever and I'm going to do the septic workup on them, I want to get the LP done because I'm the only one in the department who's going to be able to do that. The nurses can get the IV, they can get the urine on them. If there's a kid, there's a question of an airway, I want the airway managed immediately because I'm the only one who's going to be able to do the airway, I'm the, to do the intubation. Um, and then, but once the airway's managed, the other people can help me. Uh, with the, the IVs and you know, how much, you know, they can push fluids and antibiotics and meds and whatnot. So I tend to take, when I have any of these really sick kids, I get done what I need to get done front end, and then I know that I can have the rest of the department, the rest of the team help me out with the, uh, the other things. And you know, for a lot of us in this room, probably there's uh, a handful of nurses who are a whole lot better at getting the IVs th than we are. Um, so you know, the, the fact that, You've got other people to do other things is great, and that's how you work as a team. But you need to take care of what only you can take care of. All right, um, inodilators and inopressors. This gets a little confusing, because uh, if you think the child's in shock because of a cardiac problem, uh, and you need to simulate the heart, but at the same time, you need to dilate the peripheral vasculature, they're a little bit like adults. You want to either use dobutamine or milrinone. Now, milrinone is used a lot, uh, in, in the cardiac centers and whatnot. But again, it's similar to the, the prostaglandin. It doesn't work immediately. When you put somebody on a milrinone drip, it can take five, 10 minutes before you see the effects of it. Um, dopamine, on the other hand, is like dopamine and epinephrine. It works relatively quickly. If you think the child has a cardiac issue, I would probably go milrinone or dobutamine first. If I think it's something else like septic shock, I need to squeeze down the periphery then I want to go with something like norepinephrine, epinephrine, or dopamine. And probably more times than not, either epinephrine or dopamine is, is the way you're going to go with these kids. Peripheral vasopressors like pure phenylephrine probably not used that much in the kids because they always need a little bit of a kick to their heart. A lot of their cardiac output is uh, from the heart itself. In terms of the, the pressors, um, these are the doses. Um, again, if the child looks like they may be cardiac in origin. Um, you think they may have a coarctation, they have evidence of congestive heart failure. You're gonna go with dobutamine or milrinone first, all right? If they're just kind of looks like it's just peripheral vascular collapse from sepsis, you're gonna go with dopamine or epinephrine. All right, these are the, the different dosages, how you start them and the different indications for them. Antibiotics, we talked about this. Um, everybody gets ampicillin. I, there was an, a paper that came out a couple years ago that said, you know, we looked at, you know, we surveyed every hospital, you know, in the country looking for cases of listeria, which is what you got to give uh, ampicillin to cover for in these neonates, and nobody had a case. The last case we had of um, uh, listeria at our institution turned out to be the mother-in-law of the CEO of the hospital. Now, I'm not saying anything. I don't know what kind of relationship he had with her and why she was the only person in the world to ever get listeria. Um, but that was the last person we saw. Um, I don't think he's there anymore. Um, but at any rate, uh, 
Microbiology lab lost a, a specimen, too. Anyway, um, that's where you're supposed to give the ampicillin. Uh, you can go with the, the cephalosporins. I'm a big fan of cephalosporins. Genomycin you can give. Um, if you want to go amp and gen, nobody's going to criticize you at all. It's funny because back in the, in, like, again, in the Mesozoic era when I was, you know, uh, a student and stuff, Everybody's afraid of genomycin because it always used to cause this kidney damage. And, you know, we were always, the students were always running and, and drawing these, um, you know, peak and trough levels at really weird hours of the day and night. So I, genomycin's left a bad taste in my mouth. So I'm not a big fan of it. I'll go with the cephalosporins. Vancomycin. When do you give vancomycin? That's a judgment call. You know, a, a lot of times, even, even with, um, you, you tap the kid and the kid's got meningitis, you know, I, I, I'll usually get ID involved in terms of whether we're going to give vancomycin or not. And then acyclovir. Uh, if there's any question at all, there's any blister on the kid, mom's got any history of herpetic infections, go ahead and give the acyclovir, no downside to it. All right, um, take home points. Know the differential for a sick neonate, the, the misfits. Um, the other thing is keep them warm. Um, we have a habit, and, and I'm as bad as everybody else, of undress the kid and everybody's working on them. And, it's 72 degrees or so in the department. That kid will lose their, you know, the heat to the room real quickly. So, you know, we uh, have, a, you know, an infant warmer down there that we now just put the kids right on there and turn that on. Um, but if you're going to work on the kid, uh, especially if you've got your lines in and stuff, throw a warmed blanket on them. Don't, just don't leave them um, buck naked on, on the, uh, a stretcher in, in a cold emergency department. Always check the glucose. We didn't talk about umbilical lines or intraosseous lines, but there's certainly lines you can use in a neonate. Um, I think uh, umbilical lines, people have described, I think Eileen's talked about in the past, uh, putting umbilical lines in up to two weeks of age, uh, which is, uh, you know, you think, well, see that, that dried up stump there, it's got to have nothing in it. But uh, there are reports where you can cut through it and see if there, there is an umbilical uh, vein in there you, you can access. Intraosseous lines, we're, we're all comfortable with. It's a little bit tough to do it in the, the um, the kids, because they've got that skinny little tibia, uh, but it's certainly something to consider. I think, you know, getting a femoral line in these kids is actually way easier than, than, than we think. All right, uh, utilize helpful resources, and then know ahead of time where you're sending your, your sick kids. A lot of places have, have closed their PG unit. Our PG unit went, you know, with, with the surfactant and the antibiotics, you know, they said, well, keep the nursery, we're going to get yeah, the PG unit, so, from our perspective, it didn't change anything about the emergency department. We still see all the same number of, of pediatric visits. Uh, it just means that we do 100% of the stabilization now. We have no pediatric backup uh, for these kids. We get them all stabilized, and then uh, we have to transfer them. But you want to know in advance uh, where you're going to transfer for the child. Uh, and uh, it's strongly recommended that you have transfer agreements with some of the pediatric centers in the area. All righty. Thank you very much.